financial disclosures. So this is a presentation of a case, 69-year-old male who presents with a mildly enlarging pinkish lesion of the superior conjunctiva on the right side. Um, this has been ongoing for two years, um, completely asymptomatic, no irritation or pain. And before we go into a little bit more in the HPI, I just kind of wanted to show a picture of what it looked like. You can take a look at that for a few seconds. And just think about a couple things. Uh, first off, um, if you were looking at this eye on, say, a routine eye exam, um, consider whether or not you may even notice a lesion such as this. And also notice that it is on the superior conj. Um, and so in order to kind of notice this sort of lesion, um, you would actually have to, you would have to lift the lid and also consider uh, how many times you may or may not do that on a routine eye exam. So what is this? Um, so we could go into a uh, brief differential. Um, I just categorized these in a um, couple of categories. Um, first off, for conjunctival lesions, you can think of them at, <coughs> you can think of epithelial origins. Um, so on the left-hand side is a papilloma, and then um, CIN, of course, with the uh, gelatinous form, papillomatous, and leukoplakic. Then you can classify them as melanotic lesions as well. Um, so here you have a nevus, um, relatively benign. You can see cysts. Um, this is PAM. And here, of course, this is much worse melanoma. And then there are vascular lesions of the conjunctiva. So this here is a, a pyogenic granuloma. This is a hemangioma. And this is a Kaposi sarcoma. Some of these can look very similar and are di difficult to differentiate clinically. And then the classification of lymphoproliferative disorders. So this here is lympho lymphoid hyperplasia, lymphangioma, and then lymphoma. Um, again, many of these are also difficult to differentiate as well um, without pathological um, assistance. So more on the HPI, in October of 2016, uh, he actually had a conjunctival biopsy on the left eye uh, outside of Moran. And um, the diagnosis at that time was malt lymphoma. Um, a, P a PET scan was done and revealed mild increased uptake in the posterior orbits, and so it was then classified as orbital lymphoma. And so the provider at that time discussed the options with the shields at Wills, and they offered a couple of different um, uh, management options. Um, one of the options was further excision with cryo. Um, according to the provider's notes, he felt this was too far posterior in the fornix, um, and that the uh, uh, extension was probably too far posterior into the orbit. Um, they also offered a low-dose local radiation, and this was based off of a recent paper at the time that had just been presented at the academy, um, showing excellent results with very low-dose external beam radiation of four grays. And then systemic chemo if other areas were involved or if it had disseminated. At the time, the provider also noted subtle superior thickening of the conge on the right side, um, but it was felt that biopsy would be low yield, and so nothing was done for the right side at the time. And so on October 20th, he was seen by his outside uh, heme onc doc provider, and uh, at the time, he had no B symptoms, fevers, night sweats and no other involvement on the PET scan except for the orbits. And so um, the provider at that time felt that going further, including bone marrow biopsy, was um, unnecessary. Uh, however, they did uh, refer him to uh, Rad Ankh, um, but he decided to come to Huntsman, Huntsman Group uh, for a second opinion. And they also offered him the low-dose uh, radiation. And so he uh, underwent low-dose external beam radiation to the uh, left eye at that time, four grays over two fractions, two grays each. And so he uh, then presented here um, where we were uh, managing him uh, as well. Um, and so from the time of 2017 to 2019, the left eye, after it had had uh, that low-dose radiation, no changes were noted. Um, 
and uh, just mild scarring was noted. However, on the left side, initially, um, there was some elevation that was noted uh, of the conjunctiva. Um, it, did, it then resolved with topical steroids in 2017, appeared to be stable for the next two years. And then in 2019, again, um, it started to look a little bit more suspicious. In terms of the rest of his history, um, pretty non-contributory, except for the fact that uh, he had had sinus surgery, but that was for apparently chronic uh, sinus issues uh, and sinusitis. And um, his father uh, had actually passed away with pancreatic cancer. Um, no known drug use uh, or smoking, um, just very occasional alcohol. Visual acuity was relatively good in both eyes. Uh, pressure was borderline high. Everything else was otherwise normal. A little bit of MGD. Um, he did have that elevated pink uh, lesion on the right side, and the left side had some scarring that was noted, um, and a little bit of mild elevation as well on that left side. This is the 2019 exam. Um, fundus exam was normal. So these are pictures of the right side, which had not received the radiation. Um, and this is the lesion that we were watching uh, in 2017. This is what it looked like here. And 2019, a little bit more elevated, a little bit more suspicious looking. And this is the left side, which was the side that had been radiated. Um, and here you can see kind of the perilimbal scarring. Um, and actually in 2019, if you look at the two pictures, this perhaps could be a little bit more suspicious looking as well. Um, so we decided to do conjunctival excisional biopsy um, on the right side. Um, and so uh, I'll show a video of how it was similarly done, but um, we sent half in formalin and half for fresh for um, uh, sent half fresh and then uh, no concurrent cryotherapy was done. Um, but however, during the procedure, uh, we did notice some uh, significant underlying vascularization. And so this is a YouTube video of um, a very similar case. Unfortunately, I don't have video of our case. But we did demarcate the area very similarly like this. And then it was removed with Lescott scissors. And then underlying here, very similarly, we actually noted a fair amount of vascularization that did seem to be um, relatively abnormal compared to normal conjunctival tissue. But the lesion was completely removed and was then sent for um, histopathology, and flow cytometry. And then in this case, the conjunctival defect was large enough that they used amniotic membrane, which you can use to cover the resulting conjunctival defect. In our case, um, the defect was not large enough, so we left it alone. So doctor, should I be worried? This is basically the first thing he asked uh, the next day after surgery, which um, of course uh, we did not have any results to give him at that time. Um, but uh, we did notice that he had those abnormal vessels and with his history, um, uh, there were a couple things that he could have been worried about. And so eventually the biopsy results came back, highly suspicious for low-grade B-cell lymphoma, especially extranodal marginal zone lymph lymphoma of mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. Um, this term is also used to describe malt lymphoma. So is this a new malt lymphoma versus a recurrence versus previously noted disease um, before? And that was not previously addressed. And so in terms of his clinical course, he, also, he went back um, to Huntsman and ended up getting four grays and two fractions to the right orbit this time. Um, Follow-up MRI so far has shown no uh, intraorbital disease extension. Uh, he did have an incidental right parotid gland mass that turned out to be a cyst. 
conjunctiva has healed and currently doing well, and we are watching both eyes very closely. Um, we may need to continue looking at the left eye as well. So a little bit about conjunctival lymphoma. Uh, inf incidence is pretty low. Um, female preponderance around ages 50 to 70 years old. It's the third most common uh, conjunctival malignancy besides SCC and melanoma. Um, usually it's a uh, primary neoplasm, but it can be associated with disseminated lymph lymphoma. And the most classic uh, location is usually in the inferior fornix, although in his case it was in the superior. Um, the majority, about 80%, are malt lymphoma, this, and uh, these are non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Usually presents as a salmon patch, colored, uh, painless mass, and usually B symptoms are pretty rare unless it's disseminated. Um, histology is the most important prognostic factor. Uh, malt tend to ha tends to have a very good uh, prognosis. Uh, follicular is almost as good. And then the mantle and diffuse B cell um, versions are uh, much worse prognosis. Um, recurrence is actually very common, um, approximately up to 40% in malt uh, median recurrence, uh, two years in one study. And so in terms of treatment, um, we already talked about some of them. Brachytherapy is also a possibility. And then um, it's uh, been studied, um, interlesional rituximab or interferon has actually shown some good results as well. Um, and then systemic chemo for disseminated disease. Interlesional, interlesional being subconj. Uh, these are just some sample uh, slides. Here you can see um, it's uh, basically a lymphocytic infiltrate um, on uh, H&E. And then um, on, CD, on uh, staining, um, these are typically CD20 staining, um, which is characteristic for B cells, um, and usually a little bit more, more negative for the T cell stains. This is five, 10, and three, actually. Um, so I went looking for that paper that was apparently presented at Academy at the time, and I believe this is it, um, which interestingly enough, what one of the main authors was one of my previous attendings at MD Anderson, uh, Dr. Ismaili. Ismaili. But um, this paper was a retrospective review of 22 patients with um, B cell, what they called B cell ocular adnexal lymphoma, which included malt, mantle, follicular. Um, and so basically we know that radiation can be very devastating to the eye. Um, in higher doses, causing things like cataracts, uh, radiation retinopathy, and optic neuropathy. Um, in even very low doses, cataracts can form uh, in doses as low as one to two grays, and radiation retinopathy typically around 15 to 20. And so this study looked at giving very low dose uh, radiation, um, four grays to the orbit, and two, two two gray fractions. And they got this from studies showing um, good results in primarily palliative uh, patients. And so, um, so in this paper, they looked at clinical response, which they defined as clinical resolution or radiographic resolution in orbital or eyelid lesions. And most importantly, um, actually 100% of the patients that they showed um, showed some form of response, um, and many of them achieved a full clinical response um, in this study. And uh, very few adverse effects over the period of two years that they looked at, um, just one patient with dry eye. Um, and I just wanted to point out, they did have one patient who later developed contralateral recurrent malt in the other eye um, a little less than two years later. So it was clinical response meaning complete resolution with that? That's how they defined it as complete resolution. However, um, they did look over the period of two years um, and whether or not they might have recurrence. And 75% of the patients at two years, um, I'm sorry, 25 of the patients at two years actually did recur in some way, either same eye or contralateral. And this is just a picture showing what external beam radiation could look like to the orbit. Usually you have a lens shielding the eye because it can actually help pre uh, prevent cataract formation, but they actually didn't do that in the study. 
And then this is just another review. Um, I just kind of wanted to point out characteristics of malt lymphoma in particular. Um, in this study, they looked at 262 patients and um, almost 70% of which, uh, 262 patients with conjunctival lymphoma and almost 70% of them were malt lymphoma. And bilateral incidence was 18% of those with malt lymphoma. Recurrence was actually pretty high, almost 40%. However, um, if you look here, uh, ma many of them either achieved complete remission or were alive with the disease. Only 4% were thought to be dead f directly from uh, um, the lymphoma. So very good prognosis overall, which is why observation is um, still considered uh, a good management option. And that's about it. That's a nice review of, of the response and overall lymphomas. One thing that we want to not forget, even though these are low grade, mostly multi D cell lymphomas, there can be systemic association with lymphomas. And, and when Frenchy Kobiak was in New York you know, 30 years ago, he had a large group of patients with this type of lymphoma that he followed long term, I mean, even out to 15, 20 years. And what they found was that the further out you get from the initial diagnosis, the more chance there is of finding systemic lymphoma. And so with these people, we want to keep an eye on them at all times because when he went out, I mean, initially, less than 20% of them had systemic lymphoma associated you know, with this with this diagnosis. But as they went out more than 15 years, it, it went from 50 to even 75%. So you really want to follow these people very carefully for that systemic involvement that can occur. Absolutely. Just while we're changing over, I'll just add to the late side effects of radiation of various forms and also vitamicin is the, the, the spectrum of the dry eye that occurs, but um, scleromalacia, melting, those kind of things, sometimes with these higher doses that people get, you'll see that within a few years and it can be more of a problem because the, basically the blood vessels are damaged and there's just no healing whatsoever and they can be really, really hard to, to fix, uh, grafts don't take, things like that. So avoiding these high doses of radiation uh, is a good idea for a disease that may be kind of benign. Yeah, the fact that this uh, <clears throat> lower dose radiation has been successful as is, as you said, because I, uh, I remember the day when, when they were sitting up there at the, you know, 50 gray, almost, you could just about depend upon the fact that it was going to be destructive yeah, to the eye. Yeah. All right. So I'll start my presentation. Um, I did mine on cataract surgery and the management of astigmatism. This is a relatively basic topic, but I thought it was very relevant, something that a lot of us see every single day. So um, this particular patient is of a 55-year-old male. He was complaining of ghosting of images of monocular diplopia of the right eye since he had cataract surgery with a toric lens about five months ago. Um, of note, he had a history of retinal detachment in that right eye, um, had a vitrectomy, and um, also had was noted to have EBMD in both eyes, and then um, his uh, toric IOL in that right eye was done for a near target. So on exam, um, in his right eye, as you can see, he was purposely left uh, nearsighted, but he still has significant astigmatism, um, is best corrected to 2020, but still complaining of the ghosting and monocular diplopia. Um, on the exam, it was um, pertinent uh, for the findings of EBMD in both eyes. Um, that was affecting the visual axis. Um, and then upon uh, further examination, the toric lens, um, it was intended to be placed at 133 degrees, but looked like it was um, about 20 degrees off um, at 155-ish. Um, so uh, also topography, um, and tomography was done. Uh, this is a pentacam showing both uh, the pre-op um, 
images on the right and then um, the current images um, upon presentation um, next to that. And it's showing a similar pattern, some irregular astigmatism, particularly inferiorly. Um, and then it looks like uh, the astigmatism is maybe slightly getting worse. <clears throat> so um, options for this patient are obviously the most conservative is glasses, but he was still having binocular diplopia um, complaints. Um, he was also pre previous to the appointment told to increase uh, lubrication, and this has not helped um, him. So other things that we can consider are a superficial keratectomy for the EBMD, um, and then surgical options would be rotating the toric, high well exchange, or piggyback uh, lenses. So after a discussion with the patient, um, it was decided to uh, proceed with superficial keratectomy. Um, this was decided not only because it was the most conservative option to start with, um, but also uh, it would help uh, increase the uh, accuracy of the IOL measurements in the future if he mm -hmm. needed further uh, intervention. So um, the uh, top picture is of the irregular um, cornea, uh, same similar pattern to the pentacheum, uh, pre op for the superficial keratectomy, and then the inferior picture uh, shows it's more regular um, astigmatism, and you can see with his refraction that um, the axis has shifted a little bit after three months after the superficial keratectomy, and also he has better best corrected vision. Um, so uh, taking a step back, when you see a patient for um, cataract eval, uh, it's important when you're deciding to uh, whether you need to take steps prior to the uh, surgery. Um, you can, you know, need to obviously assess whether it's affecting the vision. Uh, look for particularly pay attention for EBMD, subepithelial fibrosis, Salzman's. Um, particular whether it's in the central six to eight millimeter optical zone. Also, um, really take a look at the topography, um, specifically looking at the Myers, um, seeing if they're irregular, like in this picture. Uh, also, look for biometry inconsistencies as well. Um, and then after, if you decide to move forward with um, a, a procedure, then it's important to um, be patient and delay surgery at least 30 to 90 days after treatment of the cornea to get stable measurements. Um, this is my, <laughs> I tried to make a picture illustrating <laughs> something on uh, <clears throat> Word. So um, basically this is trying to <laughs> show Salzman's nodules and um, basically the red line is trying to show that those can really flatten the cornea overall, and then once you remove them, the cornea um, can undergo a big myopic shift, and so they can be very visually significant. Um, and then dry eye is something that is um, that we all see every day, um, and that's really important to manage prior to surgery. Um, there was a few studies that uh, actually showed that um, it's over 63% uh, of patients that had no uh, preoperative pathology preventing, uh, presenting for cataract surgery evaluations um, had tear breakup times less than five seconds, and 77% <coughs> of eyes had positive corneal staining, so it really is very prevalent. Um, the Ascaris Cornea Clinical Committee um, developed an algorithm for identifying this, um, so they suggest um, doing a dry eye questionnaire in clinic and then maybe doing some point of care testing, look at the uh, refractive measurements, topo, biometry, look for those inconsistencies like we talked about, and then obviously a clinical exam. Um, another thing to think about is uh, even if you decide to move forward with the procedure, like a, superfic a superficial keratectomy um, or um, other things that you um, really have to be cautious with placement of toric IOLs even after this because of the recurrence rates. So um, EBMD after um, phototherapeutic keratectomy has shown a 13% recurrence rate and Salzman's after superficial keratectomy um, had a 22% recurrence after 
mean follow-up time in, of 61 months in one study. So um, going back to the patient, so there's a few options after this because he still has significant astigmatism, still wasn't happy with his vision. So um, obviously one option is rotating the toric. So um, the astigmatismfix.com is um, the calculator that's very popular. Um, it showed that even rotating the toric back to um, the intended target would still leave 1.18 um, of kind of oblique astigmatism. Um, so this wouldn't fully correct his astigmatism. So that's one option. Then we looked at, you know, considered IOL exchange. Um, he uh, would still, without flipping the axis, would still have, um, you know, 0.45 or 0.43 um, diopters of residual cylinder in this case. And then the last um, option that we consider was corneal refractive surgery. And so um, this is ultimately uh, the road that um, he went down. So he underwent um, PRK in this eye. And um, you can see here, uh, three months afterwards, his monocular diplopia symptoms and ghosting uh, symptoms were resolved. He had uncorrected visual acuity of 2015. And um, you can see his refraction there. Um, so just a little bit about uh, refractive surgery after cataract surgery. <clears throat> so one literature review showed that laser vision correction is more effective in predictable outcomes than intraocular surgeries, like IOL exchange and piggyback IOLs. Um, and then obviously it has the benefits of avoiding the risk of intraocular surgery. Um, and then another thing to consider um, is that pseudophagic patients tend to be older than the typical <coughs> refractive uh, patients that we have. So this can make treatments less predictable and less effective, not only um, because of tear film abnormalities, um, but they also have corneal incisions from previous cataract surgery. So this can also affect the refractive outcome. And, uh, and if you're considering LASIK, could affect the ability to make the LASIK flap. So... That's just a brief review of things to consider, and that's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what, she didn't really describe it, I don't know if there's a pointer up there, but the red line basically would simulate epithelial thickening peripherally because the epithelium wants to kind of ramp up to the whatever the elevated area is. So if you did the cataract surgery and then said, oh, well, on second thought, maybe we should take these nodules off or take that really bad pterygium off, it's up to six diopters of myopic shift because essentially you're taking off not only the nodule but all that peripheral elevation, which essentially steepens the central cornea. So it's really important to kind of figure out whether you're going to treat those things ahead of time to avoid those, avoid those huge surprises. And for residents, I mean, you need to understand these principles for optics and caps and things. This kind of how curvature changes with elevation and just kind of the effects of clinical things like this is it's just really, really helpful if you can just kind of get that in your brain of how that works. That's so helpful to understand a lot of the questions that you'll see. Just a, an issue that I wanted to raise is that part of the problem is, is that we keep creating higher and higher expectations of what results are going to be. And, uh, and so patients obviously are increasingly demanding. And I think we could help ourselves by, you know, being a little more reasonable with patients. And one thing that I'm seeing more of is that uh, patients are coming back, and, and really we've hit it about as close as you reasonably can expect to, but they're still very unhappy. And uh, it's, it's uh, residual higher order aberrations, particularly after re refractive surgery that's bothering them. It's something about the natural lens. I think there's a certain softening that the artificial, our, our intraocular lenses are allowing that to occur. And one key is, is that if it doesn't quite make sense, and it doesn't really sound like a dysphotopsy, that's how they usually are getting treated, uh, is, is to do a wavefront analysis. 
and then uh, point to the point spread functions. Is that what light looks to you? Is that what's bugging you? And if it looks like the point spread function, that's the higher order aberrations that are bothering them at that particular point. And unusual amounts of coma, uh, often, uh, you know, they'll want to try to partially correct that as cylinders, pick where cylinder doesn't, it seems to move around a lot. And so, I mean, those are the issues that we could be dealing with. And so you got to let the patient know, you know, this is, this is a little more complicated and, and you're 2015 and maybe, maybe this isn't such a big deal and, and uh, you need a contact lens or something at this point. Uh, good news is, is that I, I know we've talked about it a long time, but uh, uh, sometime in March, uh, the first serious um, human trial of um, this, this refractive index shaping in patients. And uh, uh, there are already algorithms here that will treat specifically after surgery, you know, coma, spherical aberration, cylinder, all in the same treatment at the same time. And I think that's going to be extremely powerful because it's something you do after surgery, your effective lens position is already known, you know residually what the whole system is doing. I mean, think about it. You got a, we've got a, a toric cornea with a toric lens. We've got two toric, uh, toric services with each other. And now we have a residual, which is almost like a third toric thing that we're trying to deal with. And so if we could deal with all of that in the intraocular lens based upon the outcome and get after these high, harder, higher order aberrations, we finally, I think, can really meet patient expectations of getting this, you know, really dead on. Just one more question. Presumably the torque was off so much because of the EBMD originally. And so with you or maybe Brian, you're going to cover this comment on, you know, what's your algorithm ahead of <coughs> surgery for EBMD patients? Um, I think, well, one of the things was... Use the mic, sorry. Just so. I think one of the things I brought up was, you know, looking at is the EBMD central, is it, you know, looking at the Myers on the topography. I think those are very important to tell if it's visually significant. And, um, and I think in this case, the one key feature to emphasize is monocular diplopia after the best corrected uh, prescription was put in there. So it wasn't just the toric being on back to us, patient had quality issues. Right? Yeah. That's why this is basically took care of the monocular diplopia with best correction, and then it was just a matter of you know, the torque that had been in there for a long time, rotating it, wasn't going to get rid of all of those things. So, I just think if I if I had seen that topography, I don't know that the head of cataract surgery, I would have No, no, and I, I don't think putting a torque in was wrong. It just, you know, that's just the way it turned out. Okay. I still think you're kind of, you're just trying to optimize their visual system, whether you're going to use a toric or a lens, right, after surgery, uh, glasses. So I think if you can get it regular enough, I think it makes sense. But it is tricky. I think it's hard to kind of decide. I feel like I've created a lot of really loyal patients by essentially telling them, I think we need to delay your cataract surgery. I think we, you have a really funky cornea is kind of the term that I like to use. And, and they, they can kind of appreciate that their, their body's not healthy because they're older even if they think they're healthy. <laughs> and so they can kind of appreciate that their eye is not normal and we may not have perfect outcomes after cataract surgery, but if you take them through that, let's do a superficial keratectomy, see if we can smooth out your cornea as best we can. I, I feel like you create a little bit of an advocate for your for their outcomes too. So I, I think it's helpful. But it, in some of the milder cases, I bring it up um, because I think it's an important thing because you may have to cross that bridge later um, after surgery and deal with some of these issues. So it gets challenging. So, um, so Maddie and I decided to hammer this principle home a little bit, um, unknowingly until last week. And I decided not to change just to kind of keep it going. Cause I think I have a, quite a few good clinical examples of it as well. Um, so the first one was a 72 year old who came into clinic. Um, his right eye vision had been slowly getting blurry over time. He was about 2050. Um, it was just kind of constant blurry vision with a little bit of fluctuation to it, but we couldn't get him any better than 2050. Um, he had exfoliation syndrome and a 2 plus NS cataract, um, no signs of glaucoma on exam. Um, he had a little bit of ABMD that looked pretty mild to me clinically. Um, I couldn't appreciate a whole lot going on. There was a little bit of negative stain there, um, which is an important principle to kind of take a step back, throw some more fluorescein in there, let it kind of dry off a little bit, and then kind of look at it again to see how how the pattern looks. Um, tear breakup time is actually a pretty good 
surrogate to try to figure out how significant AVMB can be as well. Um, so some things that you can kind of use on exam. He had a historic refraction where he was minus two plus two against the rule. Um, and that's kind of what we got on our exam. We weren't seeing much of a myopic shift. It wasn't I tried to give him more myopia to see if I could get his vision clearer because his cataract didn't really look 2050 to me, but it was it was bad enough. Um, but again, the cornea was kind of a questionable to me. So I, I sent him for scans for cataract surgery, told him I'd review those before surgery and kind of go from there. I tried to get topographies on any cataract eval in clinic before they're dilated, uh, but that doesn't always happen. In his case, it did not happen. So um, this was his topography um, when it was done, and he had that two diopters of against the rule astigmatism. Um, the numbers, which one did we decide is the laser? I like, I actually, I look at this pattern up here always. I'm always looking at the Myers, but I like to look in this little central zone here and look at the astigmatism numbers. So it's 44.5 here, it's 43.6 here, so a little bit irregular, and then 40.9 here and 38.9 here. So pretty big differences in the, in the astigmatism in those axes that are um, 180 degrees apart. And so irregular, I still think that he would have done pretty well with the toric had I put it in. Like it probably would have minimized some of his astigmatism. He probably would have done pretty well, but I still think he would have had problems because you're, you're gonna, you're essentially gonna overcorrect astigmatism here and undercorrect it here in your algorithm. You're just gonna do it. And so they're not ever gonna be completely plano. Um, so my astute biometer, it was crystal, um, she looked at the patient under the slit lamp and said, hey, will you look at this guy again? I think it's more significant than you're thinking because you kind of put minimal. Why don't you look at him again and, and get, get an opinion on it again now that you see the topography? And so I brought him back into clinic and I, I unfortunately did not get a picture of him, but um, you can look on here on the Myers, like it's very central that he's got this irregularity there. And she tried tears. We actually did biometry a couple of times on him. Um, and just still couldn't get it to clear up. And so I brought him back into clinic and I just said to him, look, I think we've got to deal with your cornea first. And so let's let's do this superficial keratectomy. Let's remove the skin, let it heal back and kind of see where we're at with your cataract. Wait a few months, probably do cataract surgery on you. So I wanted to just show a few different pictures of what ABMB can look like. These are, ob these are usually pretty obvious when it looks like this. You get these w weird pockets of cysts kind of all over. A lot of these patients will have kind of recurrent erosions when they look like this. Um, some more subtle ones would look where it's just kind of irregular epithelium. A um, couple other ones here. This is what his topography looked like two months after superficial keratectomy. So I mean, just a, a crazy change in his topography to the point where now he has no astigmatism. He still actually manifests that against the rule of astigmatism, which I thought was kind of interesting, um, but he corrected he was 2040 uncorrected at week one, corrected to 2020 at two months, 2015 at four months. So we delayed his cataract surgery. So he had two plus NS. Like I thought his cataract was pretty significant, but once you get the cornea kind of cleared up, it actually cleared up really nicely. Um, a year later, he came back. Um, he was still correcting to about 2025, but complaining of a lot of glare. He actually glared up to 2100. Um, um, his cataract had progressed a little bit over two years. So I did a FACO on him. Um, this was just in January, and um, I put in a ZCBU 19, obviously without any touristy in it, um, and I had to do a CTR because he had really, really loose onules. I, exfoliation scares the crap out of me, even with our training, um, because you just never know how loose the zonules are going to be. And so I'm trying to like get this guy's expectations, you know, trying to hit him right on. I cleaned up his cornea, and then I go into surgery, and I'm like, his lens is going to be tilted like because his zonules are so bad. So I was really nervous, but he ended up 2015 uncorrected. So he ended up doing super, super well after the cataract surgery. And I wanted to get into a little bit more of kind of hit the details of his case, just to kind of look a little bit more in depth at the biometry and what maybe would have happened had I done um, surgery two years ago on his cataract. So if we look at, um, so this is in 2017. Um, so this is his lens star measurements. And what clued us in to repeat the measurements was um, these little exclamation points saying that the lens star was not able to pick up good keratometry readings. Um, anytime you see that, you wanna repeat it um, because you've got a huge change in sort of the standard deviation of what it's trying to measure. So it's not getting good measurements. You're not gonna have a good outcome with that. 
Um, it, it had that astigmatism at two and a half diopters against the rule, um, which you could argue matched again with his refraction, so you might feel okay about that. But if you don't have a topography, um, you may just move forward and do a, do a toric lens. So I don't, I don't think we're the kind of center that does um, biometry without topography, but there's a lot of places around the country that do this. And we actually have a few places in the state um, that do it as well, that they don't use topography pre-op, and they're just going off of the K readings on the lens star, the Iowa Master. And I think it can get you in a lot of trouble, like it would have in this case. So um, this is again 2017, good old crystal here that had my back. Average Ks here were 43.8 on the biometry. A ZC Boo, had I gone with a standard lens, would have predicted a 20 diopter lens. <clears throat> and then we go to two years later, so 2019, his Ks are a little steeper at 44, and so he, he actually backs off to a 19 diopter lens. I could have pushed it and maybe done an 18.5, but I'm a little bit of a chicken, especially in somebody with cornea issues, and so I went with a 19 diopter lens. So had I put in that 20 diopter lens, obviously I would have probably put in a toric to kind of correct his astigmatism. Um, and then maybe you had to do a superficial keratectomy because he was still struggling, he would have ended up a little bit myopic. So I would have kind of overpowered his optic and underpredicted what his corneal power was. So you can kind of see it's pretty straightforward as far as the math, if you look at just basic lens formulas, right? So the K's increase by a diopter, it's about a 0.9 difference in theory on the IOL calculations if you look at that basic formula. And so it kind of backed it off one, one diopter on the lens. Okay, so another case. Um, so this was a 70 year old that I saw for a second opinion after cataract surgery. He was about to go on a church mission to Germany in like three months. And he was really unhappy with his outcome. So he was 2040 with best corrected vision. On dilate exam, he did have an epiretinal membrane on that right eye. Um, but I just couldn't get him seeing any better. The epiretinal membrane looks pretty significant, but not awful. Um, but horrible visual quality, just tons of glare, dryness, irritation. And he had not subtle ABMD. I mean, this was like easily the worst case of ABMD I've ever seen. And um, so I talked to him a little bit about like the reasoning why he went ahead with the cataract surgery. And he said, well, I just kind of ran out of time. I really needed that cataract out because it was getting a lot worse and I just didn't have time to do both. And because he's about to leave. On, on this uh, church mission. So this is what his ERM looks like. So he, he definitely has an elevation of the fovea with some irregularity on the surface there. He's got a little bit of disruption of the, of the layers of the retina. Um, but this is what his cornea looks like. Um, again, I think this is really hard to image, even with our awesome imagers here. Um, but you can kind of see just the irregularity and kind of the whitening that's going on with his cornea. He's got all these little um, crypts and valleys and cysts, and it's just really irregular. All that subtle stuff going through the center of the cornea too. Yeah, See, it's just it's everywhere. That's that fibrosis yep. stuff. Yep. And, and so, if you don't look carefully, you can miss that, and that could really have right. a big impact on that irregular astigmatism. Yeah, and so you, you kind of any, anytime I see a cataract, I'm like, okay, we're going to take this cataract out. I'm like, all right, we've decided we're going to take it out. I always back up and I just look at the cornea. I look at the endothelium. I look at the corneal surface. I lift their upper lid looking for Salzman's nodules. I just try really, really hard to make sure that I'm, I have the capability of getting a good outcome for them by, by examining their cornea. And then I just go straight to their macula too and just really look at their macula really closely. So it's kind of a mental approach that I have to it. As soon as I've mentally decided that cataract's bad enough, I back out and go back in deep and just kind of really examine the, the visual axis. So his left eye um, actually looks okay, but there are um, a little bit more subtle but still pretty significant ABMD. You can kind of see some of these little crypts here and then down here as well. And the central area does have some that are coming into that visual axis too. Uh, the left eye was still correcting to about 2025 at the time that I saw him. Um, this was, I think, back in 2017 as well. Um, I really liked the retro illumination photos they did down in photography because it kind of picks up some of the um, irregularities on the, on the surface. And there's a few here as well. The photo looks better in the imaging system than it does on the projector. But um, so a really hard discussion because he was he was leaving in two months and um, the superficial keratectomy can really change refractive error as we've seen um, on these previous examples. And so I was like, well, 
we can do this, but it's really going to change things. And I'm not going to have time to get you some glasses before you go. And so you're really going to be struggling until we can update glasses. They have good people there in Germany. You'll be fine to be able to get some glasses there. But um, and you could I even said to him, you could even have this surgery in Germany. I could kind of help you help connect you with somebody so that they could take you through it. And um, at the time, my OR was really booked, even though I like to do these in the OR because they're just a lot more comfortable even though it's a really quick case, but he kind of pushed me and he's like, can you just do it in the office? I was like, okay, fine. I'm like, it's not gonna be comfortable. I, I cannot keep you comfortable with this. about that one. Yeah, I, as much as I've got tetracaine and lidocaine gel, I cannot keep you comfortable. So it's gonna hurt. And after surgery, it's gonna hurt really bad because I don't have any IV medication to kind of take the edge off. So we did it in the minor room um, and it came off really easy. It actually was not very challenging. I did very exact same technique I would do in the OR, um, <clears throat> which I essentially just remove the skin, usually with wet cells, it'll actually come off pretty easy with that. And then if it doesn't, I use a little um, grease hopper blade to kind of clean up and smooth off the entire epithelium. I usually leave about a one millimeter skirt on the edge um, so that we're not getting into limbal stem cells at all. Um, and then I use a diamond burr, um, just really low frequency, just to kind of gently polish um, across the entire cornea. If you kind of sit on that diamond burr in one location, you'll remove tissue. And so you don't want to do that. You're just trying to create little micro scars. So really, really light, um, just kind of pressure across the entire cornea. And usually there's kind of this weird little flaky substance that will kind of come off, even though it looks normal and you're just trying to get a really smooth Bowman's layer. And then I put a contact lens on and usually leave that on for um, a couple of weeks to kind of help the epithelium heal. So his ABMD was awful and I did not have a pre-op topography to show you, um, but his post-op topography was, it was still not great. Like he still had a lot of irregularity. Um, this was only a month after, and again, he was about to leave. But if you look at these central numbers, it's 44 this way and 43 this way. So he still has quite a bit of central astigmatism and really a lot of irregularity on his Myers still, but, but doing reasonable. He's seeing a little bit better. I could correct him at that point to 2030. So he leaves for a couple of years, comes back, um, and this is his topography two years later. So it's smoothed out pretty good. He still has um, a little bit of irregularity in that center, but it's kind of calmed down. Um, he's now correctable to 2025 with that epiretinal membrane and a lot happier with the quality of vision that he has. But now he wants his other eye done because his cataract's gotten worse. Um, and this is his topography on his left eye. <clears throat> so a lot of times you'll get a topography like this and you're like, oh, he just, this patient just has dry eye, have him use drops and come back um, and we'll, we'll kind of deal with it later. But if you look again at the Myers and just how irregular they are, and we already know he has ABMD, um, we've seen it clinically. And so um, I told him, let's, let's do a superficial keratectomy on this eye, <laughs> do it the right way, kind of get it cleaned up, let it heal, and then we'll come back and do the cataract surgery. So I, I had him wait um, three months after superficial keratectomy um, before we started to think about cataract surgery. And what I essentially do <clears throat> is I just repeat topographies in clinic. So at one month I'll get a topography, at two months I'll get one, and then if that's looking pretty stable, we'll kind of start planning surgery and then, and then start getting biometry. And you may have to repeat biometry a few times because they're still going to be dry and, and have to deal with those issues. But so, um, so he's still irregular, but not, not as bad. So he's 44-ish in this direction. He's 43 and he's got a 42 over here. So a little bit of irregular astigmatism. My technician um, with a little bit of inexperience compared to Crystal said, I think you're a good candidate for a toric lens. So kind of plants that in his mind. Let's put a toric in to kind of correct this astigmatism. So I had to kind of smash those, those, uh, those thoughts down. He only had a diopter with the rule. Centrally, you could argue that maybe in one direction he has like two or three diopters, but it's still just not gonna work very well. Um, so I, I actually elected to do just like a, a little LRI, um, just to kind of try to minimize the astigmatism down to at least a half diopter if I could. So I just did a superior LRI on him and then um, did the FACO and he ended up doing really well again. I think he, he was 2020 uncorrected, his right eye again corrected to 2025. So I, I think if you approach this the right way, you can have good outcomes. I have other cases, I'll show you one, where this didn't work and you can't, I can't get the patient to see well. 
um, because we kind of waited too long on his pathology and I just can't get a clear cornea with him. Um, and so when you think about superficial keratectomy, I, th I think it's better to just do it, like to Jeff's point. Like if you have enough irregularity there on topography and you're seeing it clinically on exam, then I would go for it. If, you're, if you get a topography and it looks pretty smooth, I think you're probably okay just to go ahead with the cataract surgery. Um, just I tell the patients, you have a funky cornea, it can affect your outcomes, and we'll just have to see and deal with it after if we need to. So um, those are the three main reasons that I'm doing superficial keratectomy for EBMD, for Salzman's, and then for recurrent erosions. Uh, Maddie already kind of showed you Salzman's, but that's a, a pretty classic Salzman's nodule. That, that, I saw one like this at the VA um, a couple of years ago, and it, it was causing about seven diopters of astigmatism. And she couldn't get a contact lens to fit. We did a really straightforward surgery, got her astigmatism down to about a half diopter, and then she was in soft contacts doing well. So these are pretty easy to remove. Um, a lot of doctors are removing these in clinic. I usually, again, I take them to the OR just for comfort, um, a little better controlled environment. Okay, so another kind of entity um, that we deal a lot with, um, so you can see here on the nasal cornea, um, a large area of flattening on topography and subsequent steepening in the opposite axis. Um, if you look at the Myers up here, um, you can see that distortion of the Myers kind of coming across. I apologize, I don't have a topography and a picture that match, so you'll have to kind of hallucinate a little bit because this one would be a lot worse, but it's a pterygium, obviously. So. Um, these can be obviously really significant, and sometimes it's hard to tell clinically how much it's gonna change the shape of the cornea when you're thinking about cataract surgery, especially if they're only a millimeter or two on the cornea. And so I think a topography is essential to kind of evaluate these. Um, I usually am telling pa any patient that comes in with a pterygium, I tell them they can have it off. I, I just say, if you want this off, we can take it off. I don't care if it's irritated, I don't care if it's causing blurry vision. I don't want to deal with this when you disappear for two or three years and it's a lot worse. And now we have scarring, we have induced astigmatism. And so I just tell them, if you're ready, let's get it off. Because I think our recurrence rates have gone down and our surgery is successful enough cosmetically and for recurrence rates that I think it's a safe surgery. So um, another patient came in. This is the guy I was telling you about that I can't get him to correct. Um, he had four plus brunescent cataracts and didn't want surgery. He was 20-50 and he had a pretty large pterygium, which is, you can kind of see it here, but it was kind of a weird pterygium in the sense that it was more of kind of a flat, not really elevated and really broad, but it was right at the edge of the pupil margin and causing a lot of astigmatism, a lot of flattening in that area. And so I, I kind of talked him into doing the pterygium surgery, um, told him, let's get rid of those. I know you're not ready for cataract surgery, but let's at least get rid of those and see how you do. Um, he felt like he was functioning fine wasn't really complaining much other than a little bit of dry eye irritation. So I thought, let's kill two birds, let's get rid of as much astigmatism as we can and, and get this cataract, or sorry, the trigium off to help with the irritation. His left eye, kind of similar, just sort of this flat, not very elevated pterygium, um, but a lot of distortion on the topography. And it was coming very central, as you can see on here, it was getting really into the center, really distorted Myers. And if you look again at these central numbers, I mean, just crazy amounts of induced astigmatism. 25 versus 45, 40 versus and 39. I mean, just really causing a lot of distortion in that central vision. So I took the one off his right eye and it made it more regular, but it's still that it, it had been so long standing that it caused that flattening on the cornea and just didn't, it didn't really relax. So I made him wait quite a while. We actually waited about six months just to see if this would stabilize and improve and it just never did. And so if you look here, um, it's a lot more regular. He's 28, 29, 31, kind of in this direction. So he's, he's closer um, to where, where it would work. I elected to not do a toric lens in this case because it's just too irregular. A lot of people would argue, well, let's minimize it, but I think you're gonna deal with all the aberrations that you're talking about, where if you can't get a perfect match, it's gonna cause a lot of issues. Um, and so we did a standard lens and I still, I just can't get him better with glasses. He's about 20, 30. Um, after taking out his four plus brunescent cataract. No macular issues, I just can't get his cornea to, to see well. And so I think if you approach these and you just tell them, like you have a really irregular cornea, kind of change their expectations in some of these cases, 
um, I think you could have a better conversation with him after surgery um, to kind of help him understand what's going on. And luckily, he wasn't complaining about a four plus Vernessin cataract. He thinks he sees fantastic. Um, he loves his new vision with better color, even though I just, I, I'm frustrated because I can't get him seeing better and it's his cornea. And he doesn't want to do contacts, which I think would help him see better. So that that's kind of a difficult case as far as some of the pterygium. So again, I just tell patients, if you want that off, let's get it off before we have to deal with um, kind of this issue once you get to cataract surgery age. Okay, so any questions or comments about those? I know it's kind of a Setting reasonable basic, expectations but. is just incredible on the impact it has. Yeah, and the simple line that I think, one of the interesting things about consenting patients is I think if you just plant that thought in their mind, even if they don't, they can't like repeat it to you. Um, if you mention to them, hey, do you remember that I told you after cataract surgery, you might need some glasses to fine tune your vision. We're kind of at that point. They remember that. And I tell every patient, like same with complications. Sometimes complication occurs, we're gonna have to do another surgery to fix it. And then I tell them we're at that situation now where we gotta do another surgery to kind of go back and fix it. Just planting that I think is really helpful. <coughs> Sort of separate out the natural problem from the cornea problem, give you an idea of potential vision. So That's a good idea. Sure that I don't have a lot of experience with PAM either. What about like potential acuity? Would that does that help with epiretinal membranes? I haven't really any I don't think I see a retina special. Oh, there's one. Dr. Valkenberg, it, any idea? Uh, it, it, the overall accuracy of the latest information I've seen is uh, uh, is fair. I mean I I yeah. don't uh, it, it, where it's particularly helpful is where uh, the PAM does really, really well, that the retina is not so involved. If it doesn't do so well, uh, it, it's know, harder to judge it. And then it's much yeah. harder to know for sure whether that, that's just the patient having a hard time, they're not right. seeing it, other issues. But, but if you get a really good result with PAM, that's pretty encouraging that the retinal yeah. patient is not as, as, as that's, impactful. That's a good, I don't use that method very often. I send them to Dr. Petty to do it, or Dr. Meyer, but um, Dick's Petty, not Jeff. I think I think we've smashed that. But okay, so um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and just give you a, a quick smattering of kind of what's new in cornea, um, just so you have an idea of some things that are changing a little bit. Um, the first one is kind of a, a, a simple study that Dr. Lynn and I are involved in. Um, multiple myeloma is a really awful um, cancer. It's a bone marrow cancer where you get excess plasma cells. And typically it's kind of just a low grade um, cancer that you can survive. I think survival rates at, at kind of initial treat or a diagnosis is about seven to 10 years. Um, but as soon as it kind of starts to cause a lot of issues, your survival rate drops off dramatically. And, and they're kind of running out of treatments. And so you have this um, refractory type where they failed two or three different treatments and now they're they're essentially they have less than one year to survive and so they came out with a new it's kind of this humanized antibody um, that is giving amazing survival rates for these patients and so we're, we're involved in a study at huntsman for this um, that the medication has actually just finished the initial phase two trial and so it's probably going to start um, coming out more and you'll you'll probably see patients with this um, so it's called belatimab mafidotin um, and what we've essentially found in this study is about 70% of patients um, develop keratopathy. Um, and about half of our patients, we had to delay treatment or stop treatment because of how bad it got. We didn't ever have anybody break down into like ulcers or infections, but like three, four plus um, PEK, um, confluent kind of stuff and, and really rapid tear breakup times. Um, and so you can get kind of all these different grades of, of how bad it can get. But um, a lot of our patients in Utah ended up grade two or three. And, um, and so we were having to deal with a lot of really bad dry eye. So that's something that you might come across with multiple myeloma patients. Um, Sequa is a new dry eye um, cyclosporin um, medication. It's a little higher percentage compared to Restasis. And um, they think the vehicle actually is, is making a lot of difference as far as the dry eye treatment too, not just the cyclosporin. They've got some novel vehicle to try to get better penetration of the, of the drug. Um, so it's a calcineurin inhibitor. Um, they did a study of about 1,000 patients. 
Um, 22% of the patients had pain with installation and kind of redness, periocular redness. Um, the post FDA kind of studies, um, at least just not really studies actually, it's more just experience from on Karenet, um, is that patients are actually tolerating it pretty well. I have not personally prescribed this. Dr. Lin has a few patients on it, it's still relatively new. Um, at three months on, in the study, about 16% of patients had a 10 millimeter increase in Schirmer scores. So that, that's a dramatic increase in tear production. Um, but the vehicle actually had an 8% increase. So the vehicle actually has, without cyclosporin, and it actually seems to have some effect too on, on dry eye. So um, it's a little bit tricky to prescribe as far as cost as these always are. Um, and so there's, there's kind of three ways that they recommend doing it. If you just e-prescribe it to this um, RX Crossroads in Kentucky, there's a specific pharmacy in Kentucky um, that does it. Or if you fax, you can download this form on their website if you fax that into the number. Um, that's kind of the best way to get coverage for it. And so the, the cost right now for a one month supply through this pharmacy is $90. And for a three month supply, it's $180. So you'd wanna give a three month supply of it and it's kind of similar to Restasis where um, if patients kind of recap their vials, um, a three month supply is actually lasting six to nine months. So it actually can be pretty, pretty cheap for patients um, if you go through this pharmacy. So that's Sequa. And then um, we're doing- Have you had comparison with- uh, Haven't had one yet. Haven't seen anything yet head just to head. Just general, what, what are they saying out on that? I mean, they feel it's a, it's, it's a more comfortable drop, it's a, I mean, I'm seeing the hype. The hype is coming. It's a more comfortable drop, and it, the onset is a little faster. And, yep. the, and the, I know there's no good solid comparison, but yeah, that seems to be the sentiment out there. But it's always hard to know if it's right. if it's the hype of the patients enjoying a new medication. And they often that. hesitate to study because uh, often when they do, they find out they're better. So yep, exactly. Hype's yeah. better than the truth. Yeah, and yet you do have some other options for cyclosporin too. Um, Restasis has become just hit and miss on coverage. And so um, I use Imprimis RX quite a bit. It's uh, $50 a month or $150 for a three month supply and they mail it to the patient. So Imprimis Pharmacy's compounding a cyclosporin and it's a little bit higher. Um, I think it's a 0.1%. And I, I use it mostly for like stem cell deficiency or, um, or other ocular surface problems, not just dry eye. But. Um, amniotic membrane drops. So this is kind of something that we're very interested in kind of learning more about is, is how do amniotic membrane drops help with ocular surface healing and uh, dry eyes and ocular surface disease. So there's two studies that are um, sort of one in the works and one that's ongoing. Um, we're studying amniotic membrane drops in GVHD ocular disease. And so um, we're bringing patients in and, and essentially just doing a one month treatment. It's a fellow eye study. So one eye gets vehicle, one eye gets um, amniotic membrane drops. And then we're looking at tear breakup time at one month, three months, six months. So they're just on one month of treatment and then we're seeing the results. It's kind of a little bit of a safety study and efficacy study at the same time. And then we have um, a new fellow refractive PR case study as well, um, looking at amniotic membrane drops. I don't think we've lifted yet, but we're getting closer to um, starting this. And so it's gonna be a fellow eye study as well. It's a safety study. Um, and so we're looking at amniotic membrane drops in one eye compared to the other and looking at epithelial healing. Um, and then there's a little bit, there's kind of some surrogate outcome measures that we're looking at too, but again, it's mostly just a safety study at this point. So those are kind of what we're doing on amniotic membrane drops. Um, there's a couple of new changes to sort of run of the mill medication. So Patanol and Patidae has now been approved as an over-the-counter um, dispension um, for patients with allergies. It's not quite available yet, but the FDA has approved that, so we're getting closer to having that available. Acyclovir ointment, which is a huge addition to our armamentarium for treating um, herpes eye disease, um, was approved by the FDA, um, and then they had some manufacturing issues, and so that's on hold, but that should be available at some point soon. So I can stop sending my patients to Canada to get their acyclovir ointment because it works really well in kind of some of the chronic HSV or VZV cases. Is it 9.04 or 8.53? 9.04. Dang it. I'm looking at the wrong clock. Let's get out of here.